Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, present my research here. So um, what I'm going to try to do is to put the fintech, um, the, the, the introduction of fintech in finance in the broad perspective of how the finance industry has evolved um, in the long run and in particular since the, the financial crisis. So this is my very scientific way to summarize where I think we are and uh, where we would like to be. <laughs> so. <clears throat> The current system looks like this uh, Brachiosaurus, which is uh, expensive, levered, and too big to fail. Um, there are many people around the world who um, are like this Rodin thinker here. Um, that includes regulators and entrepreneurs, I'm supposed many people in this room, trying to think about ways to make that system better. And many of them have a vision of, of what a better system could look like, and maybe it's going to look like this antelope on the bottom right corner. Um, and the big question is how do you get from A to B, right? How do you get from uh, bronchiosaurus to the antelope, I suppose from B to A then? Um, and then the fintech part to me is this little mouse in the left corner, which is today about as relevant as mammals were at the time of the dinosaurs. And um, so it's tiny, it doesn't really matter in terms of volume. Uh, I suppose most of it is hype, but there is hope. Okay. So, uh, so the question is, you know, what can we say about a good system and uh, how far are we from, from there? So let's, let's take a long run at, um, a look at the long run history. So this is financial intermediation in the US over the past 130 plus years, right? So there are two uh, lines on this graph. The first one, uh, which is in uh, red, is a measure of the, the, the entire amount of financial intermediation in the US. That is, every single a financial contract which is intermediated by the finance industry, whether it's bond, loans, equity, whether it's providing liquidity or credit. Um, this uh, and is scaled by GDP just to make it easy to compare over time. So um, if you look at the scale, it's on the right. Um, in the uh, late uh, 19th century, financial assets, intermediated financial assets or GDP was of the order of one. So roughly speaking, we were, you know, uh, moving around one times GDP in financial assets. Um, and then today we are around four times GDP, right? Um, so that's the, um, this is essentially the amount of stuff, of financial contract that goes through the pipes of the financial system. So that's kind of the output of the finance industry. Um, what about the cost? Well, the cost is how much we pay for this intermediation. So the green line is the sum of everything that the non-financial uh, sector governments and uh, firms and households pay to the finance industry, also scaled by GDP, right? And that's on the left scale. So we used to pay about two points of GDP for financial intermediation, 2% uh, in the late uh, 19th century. Today, uh, we pay about 4% uh, percent of, uh, sorry, 8% of uh, GDP for financial intermediation. So uh, the last thing I want to mention is these two curves look like they are very correlated. That actually is an interesting fact because there is not a single data source which is the same between the red line and the green line. Okay. Um, so that's an interesting fact. It's also striking that the ratio looks about constant because back in the days, 100 years ago, we were intermediating one time GDP and we paid 2% GDP for it. So that's a unit cost of 2%. Today we intermediate four times GDP and we pay 8%. Well, that's again 2%. Right? So if you take the ratio of these two curves, you get this line. And so when I did that research, it looks like nothing now. That looks like that literally took eight years to get all of this data together. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's academic research is always embarrassing exposed. Um, but it's striking that the one thing I did not anticipate is that this line would be flat. This kind of 200 basis points unit cost of intermediation. I was damn sure when I started that research that I would see post-1980 a downward drift, right? Because how is it possible that the unit cost is the same today as at the time where people had the fax machine and pencil and paper to do everything, right? How come we don't see the huge impact of computers there making everything cheaper on a you know, per dollar basis? <coughs> so to me, that was the big puzzle. And that's what led me to conclude that finance was still expensive, surprisingly expensive. Now this is for the US, you might think, what about the rest of the world? It turns out that everybody's going toward 200 bips. Okay, so this is uh, the US, France, Germany, and the UK. Sure, back uh, in the 70s, there were, you know, financial markets were not really integrated. Uh, there were many restrictions to trade, so you wouldn't expect necessarily the same unit cost everywhere. But today we're in a world where it looks pretty much uh, similar in most countries. 
for which uh, we have data. And so everybody's around the 200 basis points uh, unit cost. Okay? So just to put that in perspective, this is what did not happen in finance. Okay? So I took one industry which, in my mind, uh, has some, I mean, bear some resemblance with finance. That's retail trade. In the following sense, we have lots of customers, and uh, you know, it's like the retail product. And also, uh, suddenly, or relatively suddenly, you switch from uh, a relatively standard system to a system which uses a lot of IT. Okay? That happened in the 80s and mostly in the 90s, and a lot of it was, of course, uh, thanks to uh, Walmart. Mm -hmm. So very large investment in, in IT, in that industry. What happened afterwards, that's the relative price of retail trade services relative to the price index in the US. Very sharp drop. What that means is that the entire efficiency gains that Walmart brought from all the things we know about, like just-in-time supply chain management, all based on IT. The entire efficiency gains that came from these investments was essentially translated into lower costs for consumers. And I would argue this is precisely what did not happen in finance. Okay? And my hope is that this is what might be happening today. Um, all right. So let's go back to my uh, Broncos Um so post-crisis, what have we done? I think post-crisis, we move on the, around the first arrow. We essentially, we focused on making the system safer. That was like priority number one. And today, we are thinking about keeping it safe or safer, uh, but also trying to make it more efficient, okay? which uh, is a very different strategy. So I would argue that um, the idea that we're going to make it more dynamic or uh, more competitive direct by shrinking it the way we did uh, post-crisis, that actually is a dead end. It's a dead end for many reasons, but one of the main ones is that the, the willingness of uh, global uh, cooperation along these lines, I think, is largely gone. And so we are back to everybody is trying to defend their own, um, their own industries. Um, the, coordination, the coordination costs are going to just only be, be higher. So I think that's going to prevent us from going from, you know, the, going down left. And even if we went there anyway, the next step is qualitatively different. Because it's not about shrinking or making the, the old system safer. It's about changing the way it looks, the way it works. And that's a design problem that clearly is not the job of the regulators to figure out. Okay, so there's something qualitatively different there. So that's why I think that the only way that this could happen is uh, if we have, for lack of a better word, what I try to call regulated evolution. Um, and that has two parts. First, you need some containment. Okay. You need to make sure the dinosaurs don't grow back too quickly, otherwise there will be no room for the little uh, mouse to develop. So that's the sense in, so that's broadly speaking, trying to keep the set of regulation we've set in place after the financial crisis, just to leave some room uh, for new entrants. Um, and then you want to have uh, evolution. And that has actually two st steps that are distinct. The first is you need entry. If you don't have entry, it's hopeless. So you need to make sure there is entry. But that's not enough, because there is no, nothing that, in general, but in finance in particular, there is nothing that guarantees that the new entrants are going to evolve in the way you would like them to evolve. Okay? Prime example in my mind is money market funds. Um, and we can come back to that in the Q&A, uh, if you want. But if you don't regulate the evolution, you will not end up with the product you would like to have. Um, so. Uh, entry and then regulated evolution. And the argument there is you don't need to know where, you don't, it's not a design problem. You don't know where you're going to. It's, a, it's an evolution problem. You just start and you let the system evolve. Okay. So if that works, what's, what's the hope? What's the hope? Um, so what I did there is I actually look, look at, read all the papers for the conference, and I think they, they, you can see how they fit in the big picture. What fintech can do for us, you can classify it in different you know, buckets. So clearly, and that's maybe you're going to argue that I'm a bit obsessed by this, but mm -hmm. the first one is lower costs. Right? I think the costs in France are still way too high. Okay? And so lower costs is clearly one hope, and robo-advisors, one side of robo-advisors fits into that bucket. Um, then democratize access and improve decision making. Um, I don't think we can make a large claim that in most advanced economies, we need more credit, for instance. Okay? Because we are at the stage where uh, credit to GDP ratio is pretty high, and uh, the data suggests that we are definitely hitting the decreasing return to scale in terms of just deepening the credit markets, for instance. <coughs> um, on the other hand, better credit allocation, or quicker, 
or cheaper, that would be useful. Okay? Now, that means uh, for people who are priced out, including the poor, for people who don't understand the new technologies, including the, the old. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think some of the papers we're going to see in this conference are exactly about, about these. Uh, uh, about these, these opportunities. Now, it, there's not a guarantee of success, but at least there is hope. Um, the last thing, which I think is not as emphasized today, but I think there's also a hope that we would have an economy which is less reliant on debt. I think some of the reasons we have so much debt floating around is partly design and part, partly just a bug, essentially. Um, and there are many things we could do without debt contract, but we just use debt because it's convenient. Um, and it seems to me that many of the tech solutions we see today tend to be more equity friendly. For instance, if you look at the kind of uh, funding solution proposed by uh, PayPal, by Square, they are not debt contract, actually. They, are, they look a bit like equity contract, because the repayments are proportional to sales. It's not like a fixed coupon. Okay? That means that, by design, they have better restructuring properties. Okay? That's true for, this is like for funding uh, small businesses. To think about another market, like the market for student debt. Well, so if you look at the Holberton School, for instance, uh, their tuition actually is the opposite of the usual system, which is debt upfront, but this is equity exposed. You don't pay anything, you don't pay tuition, but you commit to giving 17% of your you know, first wages essentially for the three years after school or three or four years after school. That's actually a much better system in terms of the macro perspective because it's less debt, more risk sharing, more stable. Okay? That's something we can also get, uh, hopefully. All right, but I don't want to be too optimistic, so. There are many ways these things can go wrong, okay? <clears throat> so here I was like, that. there's the, the mice that turn into some kind of rabbit, and then hopefully this rabbit can evolve to something uh, useful and agile like an antelope. But this is not the incentive of the rabbit. The rabbit doesn't want to become an antelope. That would make no sense. The rabbit... <laughs> <laughs> the rabbit is like me, a big, a, a big, a big fan of, of uh, British movies. And he wants to become uh, the were rabbit in Wallace and Gromit. <laughs> and it's, why? Because it has the same exact incentive as Brachiosaurus. It's obvious, right? So if you don't have uh, some strategic regulation, you will not end up with the desired system. Okay? So I think that's something the regulators need to, uh, need to understand. And now in practice, what does that mean? It means there are some uh, specific challenges that are going to show up, are showing up, when we think about um, uh, fintech, okay, and uh, there are many, and this is not a comprehensive list, but I want to highlight three. Uh, the first, the obvious one is the use of data is going to be different, and therefore you're going to have more challenges into that. Cyber risk is obvious, obviously the number one, um, so we're going to have a paper on that. There is also uh, the way you use the data, the access of some new kinds of data, in the particular genetic information. That's a big issue when you think about insurance, which is all about ex ante sharing the risk. So there's some information we may or may not want to have. Um, so that's for the data. Um, the second thing is, and again, we're going to have a paper on that, and I'm sure many discussions, but the legal framework is going to have to change, okay? Because you're going to have to figure out a way to decide what a robot can be liable for. And, uh, and then we're going to need to build expertise on that. That's the obvious uh, second challenge, which is specific to FinTech. And the third one, is, um, I think it's very important too, which is we need to find a, a, a strategy, and it's not just legal, to deal with mistakes. It's a bit like drive, to me it's very much like driverless cars, you know, which is the way the mistakes are gonna be perceived may be very, very much different uh, from the true cost of the mistakes, okay? And, um, you know this old saying that the, the perfect is the enemy of good? I think it's true in general, but if there is one place where it's going to be more true than ever, that's in FinTech, right? Because if, we, if, if, if the bar is the system needs to look perfect before it's approved, then we're going to go nowhere, okay? And also it would be a big mistake because I think the old system was actually pretty bad, okay? So if you apply it to robo-advisor, I think if you look at the track record of human advisors, it's pretty poor, actually. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we shouldn't ask robots to be perfect, just need to be better, and that's a much lower bar. Okay. Good? Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.